Um, so if people, as we are waiting for people to join us, could log on to Mentimeter, which is menti.com, and there's a code on the slide there um, that people can put the code into and get some questions that we're going to ask you to um, uh, fill in uh, your responses to. Um, the other thing is, if you could also, as I see somebody's already started, start just introducing yourself in the chat so people can see um, who's joining us this afternoon. Um, so I'll just start by introducing myself. I'm Jo Bibby. I'm the Director of Health, Health at the Health Foundation. Uh, the Health Foundation is an independent charity that works to improve health and care across the UK. And um, we've had a focus for many years on um, young people and how the experiences that they have between 12 and 24 shape the access they get to the building blocks of good health. Um, and so it's great to be here today with colleagues to talk about some of the um, insights that have come from that work and the experiences that other people have on how to meaningfully involve young people in policy work. Um, so I can see people are introducing themselves, which is great. And um, hopefully you're also able to um, feed into questions. Just to outline um, how we're going to run uh, the session this afternoon. As I say, we've got four panelists who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, each of them will do a short sort of lightning introduction on some of their initial thoughts in answer to the question about involving young people in policy work. We then go into a kind of more discursive panel session where um, I'll be putting some questions to panelists and sort of hearing their reflections on that. Um, but we would like you to be putting questions as well into the Q&A, which will then have a chance um, for me to put to the panel on your behalf. Um, and also, uh, you know, opportunities, I think, to use the chat um, to share some of your thoughts. So before I introduce the panel, I suppose I wanted to just reflect a couple of things and why this feels a really important and quite timely topic, I think, to be um, discussing, um, of how we involve young people's voices in policy making. And one of the reasons why I think this is such an important question for us to be answer, trying to answer is that young people's voices, I think, are often crowded out um, kind of politically and, you know, in a sense, democratically. Um, they're often seen as the people who don't go out and vote, so maybe not as important to be appealing to as old people who um, tend to vote more. Um, there, we also know that demographically we're moving into a kind of ageing population where there's just going to be more older people and their voices are likely to be heard perhaps more than younger people. Yet at the same time, we've got young people who I think, you know, by any stretch have experienced, um, you know, the last five years or so with a lot of challenges um, around the pandemic, but also around cost of living, sort of wider economic situation that we're in, and the future uncertainty that people face around work, around climate and so on. So I think young people at the moment are experiencing something that's really quite different from um, many of us would have experienced at that phase of our lives. And ultimately, I think as we look to the future, young people will be doing a lot of heavy lifting for the rest of society. Um, they are our future, they're our future workforce, they're our future kind of carers and leaders and so on, you know. And so how they're involved in our policy work is absolutely critical. And the Health Foundation has been doing work for the last six or so years, um, looking at that experience between 12 and 24 and whether it equips young people with the building blocks of health. And, from that work, two um, strands of activity came out. We're going to hear from some of the people who've been involved in that. We funded a series of policy posts in organisations across um, the different policy sub sectors, so transport, employment, um, the economy, health and so on, and wanted to ask those organisations really to pay attention to what young people need from policy development in those spaces. And we also have been doing research um, looking at 
what how do we as a society ensure that young people get the policy support uh, sorry the emotional support that they need as they transition into adulthood because again so many aspects of our society today are different from what it was you know even 15 years ago um you know let alone longer and and therefore how as a society we can ensure that young people get the emotional support um to make that transition into adulthood is so important so we have four speakers who are going to um, uh, take us through this um, today. Um, I'm joined by Toby Murray. Toby's a senior research officer at the Money and Mental Health in Policy Institute. And prior to that, he was policy fellow at the RSA, where he led on the project that Health Foundation funded there on young, young people's experience of um, insecurity. Um, we're joined by Russia Hamid from Toynbee Hall, who is the lead researcher support and the extent to which um, they're able to access what they need. Um, also, Nairn McDonald is joining us. Uh, Nairn has been involved in the work that the Health Foundation has done on young people for the last six years. He was a citizen's researcher in North Ayrshire. He's also a counsellor in North Ayrshire, and he's been very, very involved in both our work and the work at the RSA. And then finally, Emma Rigby, um, who is the chief executive of the Association of Young People's Health, who we've worked with certainly in a number of different ways. And Emma herself has worked um, in the youth sector for over 20 years. So a great panel, I think, in terms of the work that they've done and how they've done it um, in terms of the involvement um, of young people. So um, I'm afraid it does look like there may have been some problems with the Mentimeter, but we'll perhaps come back to that if we can a bit later. But I think in the meantime, I'm going to hand over now um, to the panel to... Um, to introduce um, some thoughts. I'm going to go through the order that I introduced them. So starting, Toby, with you, if you could just share your initial reflections um, in sort of the next five minutes. Brilliant. Thanks, Joe. Uh, and it, it's it's lovely to be back. It's been a couple of months uh, since I moved on from the RSA. So it's nice, nice to always uh, come back to <laughs> come back to these roots. Um, I'm going to talk very quickly about uh, who the RSA are and, and what they do with young people before I go on to uh, talk about uh, how we worked with young people specifically. So the RSA, uh, and I'll hopefully build in some work from Money Mental Health as well. So the RSA is an organisation uh, really focused on building participation. Uh, I might slip into kind of we every now and then, uh, but I guess that is it's, it's more what they deliver these days. Um, so their mission is uh, around building a world in which everyone is able to participate in creating a better, more regenerative world. And the work specifically, as Joe's already said, that I led there uh, was on young people's future health and economic security. So building on the brilliant work the Health Foundation already set up um, and building on what I think was already quite a participatory approach to understanding people's experience through complex economies. Um, so rather than focusing on where you land on metrics, economic security was very focused. Uh, on how you feel and how you feel you're navigating the world at any particular time. Um, and uh, I will talk a bit about what we found very quickly. Uh, we found that young people are really on the sharp end of quite a lot of insecurity. About 49% of young people uh, told us that they uh, either weren't sure, uh, weren't able, sorry, 49% of young people uh, reported being financially insecure across a range of measures. Um, and particularly that really fed through into young people's feelings of insecurity as well. Um, and through some work that we did, uh, which I'll talk a bit more about in a second, uh, we identified, I think, what Joe really hit on in the intro, that young people have this real sense of atomization and alienation at the moment. Um, and I think that is a challenge for all of us as researchers. It's a challenge for them in their lives uh, where they can't expect to receive the kind of support that maybe previous generations could have done, where whether that's access to social housing, whether that's access to a comprehensive welfare state, whether that's access uh, to, to kind of emotional support, as Joe was saying. Um, but it's also a challenge for us as researchers and as policymakers and as policy designers, um, where young people, I think, and this came through again and again from the project, uh, don't have that much faith in the system to support them. Uh, lots of the kind of experience that I had from young people on the ground was why are we engaging with this? Uh, no one wants to hear from us. And even if we do tell you what's happening, uh, nothing is going to change. 
Um, so we'll come back to that in a second. And just quickly to introduce Money Mental Health as well. Uh, we're a think tank founded in 2016 by Martin Lewis, um, the money saving expert. Uh, I don't know whether he comes with a V beforehand, but uh, I've started giving him one. So hopefully that's good. Uh, the money saving expert. Um, and our, our mission is to break the link between poor mental health and financial distress. Um, and we do that through a range of research and policy work. Um, and fortunately, we also have some work coming up on young people's experience of both those things uh, next year in 2024. So keep an eye open for those. Um, so what did we do uh, with, with the Young People's uh, Economic Security and Future Health Project? Uh, first of all, I think we made sure that it was work that was done for young people by young people. Uh, unfortunately, I'm 20, I was 29 when I started working on the project. Uh, so I wasn't counted as a young person under our own definition, which was 16 to 24. Uh, so to kind of counteract that, we brought in this brilliant group of 14 young advisors. Uh, they were kind of our main stakeholders throughout the project. Uh, they joined us in 2020, kind of at the turn of the pandemic. Um, they were all aged between 16 to 24. And by working with a brilliant uh, partner, Leaders Unlocked, we were able to kind of recruit a really diverse set of young people to guide the project. Uh, and I think that is probably like a key lesson in making sure that not just you have young people uh, in position to support the work that you're leading, but also that those young people represent a range of experiences. Uh, I think all of us as researchers or uh, policy people working with young people will probably have got used to kind of this, the usual suspects. And it was really uh, the people that always put their hands up. Uh, so it was really, really important for us at the RSA that we, we engage people that weren't kind of those usual suspects and, and engaged uh, people from a range of ethnic backgrounds. Uh, we had a gender balance. We made sure we, we tried to bring in a range of LGBTQ plus uh, experience as well. And from across the socioeconomic background uh, spectrum as well. Um, particularly with our focus on economic security, we wanted uh, kind of over representation of that last one in particular. Uh, we made sure that when we were working with those young people, uh, we brought in kind of regular meetings, quarterly meetings, um, wherever possible, so that the research, again, it wasn't kind of a tokenistic offer. They were able to really shape the research because they understood what we were doing. They understood our policy asks, uh, and they were really driving us forward on that and challenging us to do more and to be better. Um, and that was definitely my experience from every single time I interacted with that brilliant group was uh, that they would be encouraging and they would kind of check our research and they'd, then they'd reflect on whether what we found uh, matched their experience but they'd always challenge us to do more and to ask better questions and uh, reflect on those questions. Uh, and then not just the kind of governance of the project, but also the methods that we employed as well. Um, and I think this is really key for policy is finding ways to tell those stories. And certainly when we would speak to MPs through the project, the things that they would be most interested in were not the stats um, that we found, but the stories of young people um, and their experience through life. Because I think that is often the thing that they're missing uh, when, when you're either in Whitehall or at Westminster. Um, so we undertook a process of diary research where we followed young people through their lives for 12 months and asked them to record their experiences in general, um, but also their, their experience with a wide variety of specific topics. So we got them to talk about um, their housing, their health, their mental health, uh, their financial education, uh, their transport situation. And we tried to piece all of that together into a picture of like what it's like to be a young person in 2023. Um, and then following that, we also undertook this great piece of work uh, of policy design, of co policy co-design workshops across the UK. So we worked in Gwynedd, in Bradford, and in Armagh, in Northern Ireland, um, where we ran two workshops. One, where we introduced young people to our research so far and allowed them to kind of tell us what was really driving them and what they identified as the key things. And then the second workshop, where we zeroed in on uh, how we could solve those challenges. And I think often when we work with young people, or certainly, like, I've, I've been guilty of this, um, we really want to catch that optimism and run with that. But what was brilliant about these workshops is we brought them together with decision makers who could not just kind of be inspired by what those young people were telling them, but could also challenge them. And I think young people are really good at occupying the gray space when we offer them that opportunity. And so when we bring them together with people that can challenge their thinking and can kind of give them, give them some of the reasons why stuff that they might like to happen can't happen, they're really good at responding to that and finding new creative solutions. And I think that's a great way of bringing together that creativity we see young people have all the time uh, with the kind of difficulties and nuances of policy work in general. Um, I have loads of lessons I could share, but I'm aware that I've probably hit my five minutes. So I'm gonna pause there and hopefully we can bring some of it in towards the end. Right, yeah, 
Yeah, thanks, Toby. We'll have plenty of time for a uh, conversation on this. So I'm going to turn to Russia now, who will talk about the work that you're doing as part of the Emotional Support um, Programme. Um, hi, everyone, and, and lovely, <laughs> lovely to be here. Um, so I am the research manager at Toynbee Hall. Uh, we've been based in the East End of London since 1884. Um, and originally started as a settlement house, and we've we've changed modes over the years. Um, but now we we work with a wide range of partners um, to really help shape a fairer and happier future across the UK. Um, that includes advice services, community spaces, and also our research and policy team. Um, one of the things that we do at Toynbee Hall that's a bit different from a lot of research and policy teams is we use a participatory action research approach. Um, in brief, that basically means that we bring people in with lived experience from the very beginning of a project. They help us co-design the focus. They're there with us every step of the way. They design the questions. They carry out the research. And we're really like a facilitator to enable that lived experience uh, to produce research that's of really high quality. Um, and so, as Joe mentioned, we're, we're part of the Emotional Support for Young People program. Uh, we're looking at the impact of increased living costs on the relationship between young Londoners and their families and what the consequences are for young people's health and development. Um, and with a particular focus on low income young people and ethnic minorities. Um, and so we have 12 peer researchers, 12 young people between 16 and 22 who have been developing the project. Um, and as Toby said, like young people really do bring very inventive and creative solutions. So we've our uh, workshops originally, you know, we had planned just to have some straightforward focus groups that got uh, very much thrown out. And we've got a very creative approach that uses arts based activities and then sociograms and then one on one interviews. Um, and so I, like I, I get the privilege of just helping support and facilitate that. Um, and going where they they need us to go. Um, one of the great things about this project as well is we've been able to partner with Thrive London, which is a citywide public mental health partnership in London. Um, and we've worked with them before on projects with young people um, as well. And so it's been really beneficial because we can bring in lots of different partners throughout the project. There's been a lot of opportunities for learning. Um, both for us in, in how we collaborate with young people, but also um, the young people themselves. Uh, we found that if we offer them training opportunities, they will definitely request many different training opportunities as much as possible. Um, so we've been able to steer that. Um, I'm sure we'll go into some of the findings in more detail later. Um, definitely there's been a lot about uh, cultural competencies when it comes to talking about mental health. Um, so a lot of our ethnic minority participants have found it very difficult to both communicate with their parents and families how they're feeling because there's maybe a language barrier or, or a barrier of cultural expectations, but also um, barriers with explaining some of the nuances to therapists, to people the mental health providers in general who might not understand why things are particularly the way they are. Um, and so that's been really interesting to dig into and to start to work with young people on ways that we might be able to create solutions that can help with some of these issues. Um, I think the final thing I just want to touch on uh, before I hand back is um, We've had experience working with people in a large number of ways. As I mentioned before, we did a partnership with Thrive London on co-designing what better mental health services would look like. We did a young private renters project and we've done a community safety project where we brought young people in partnership with older people uh, to dispel stigma around young people. And one of the things that we have found that has been really useful, really beneficial with that is um, giving people a direct voice as much as possible is really impactful and really does make a difference with stakeholders and partnerships. So for example, in our Young Private Renters project, we have um, 
we have membership of the Renters Reform Coalition that is entirely spearheaded by our young people. We take a step back, we let them go and they speak on their issues. And we found consistently that when we give young people the power to do these things, they do it very well. <laughs> and I think a lot of stakeholders, a lot of uh, decision makers, a lot of people in general are very hesitant to do that because they're worried it will go wrong. Um, so I think I, I just want to add that from our experience, the more power that you give to young people, the better a project can turn out and the more impactful um, the research that you have will be. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so we're now going to turn to Nan to hear about his experience being on both sides of this, really, I think. So, Nan, over to you. Thanks, Joe. And yes, yeah, so as Joe said, I joined the Young People's Future Health Inquiry initially six years ago as a participant, as a citizen researcher here in North Ayrshire. And we worked with this organisation I'd never heard of, Leaders Unlock. And we went around and we spoke to young people about mental health, about the issues they face, the discrimination they face. And from that, I was invited to join um, the advisory board. And it's been a really amazing experience, I have to say, being able to sit on a board with people who are leading professionals and advocates for, for young people for mental health change and for policy change. And to be treated as an equal is exactly the kind of experience these young people should be getting, you know, to be in a room with Joe and, and Julie Unwin and others. and and to feel that your voice is, is respected at the same level as theirs is, is, a, is a really impactful and powerful thing. And as, as Joe said in my introduction, I'm now a counsellor here in North Ayrshire, so I can now see it from both sides. You know, I've been that young person fighting for policy change. Now I'm an elected official trying to keep that policy change and finding that it's not quite as easy as maybe I thought it was. And the organisation that I also work for um, part-time is Leaders Unlocked. So Leaders was the partner with the Health Foundation on this. Leaders as a social enterprise that was founded by our amazing CEO, Rose Dowling. Now, I have a passion for giving young people a voice. And Leaders is really a, an organisation based on equity. So we are citizen researching is what we do. It's our kind of raison d'etre. We train in young people to allow them to go and research, to allow them to lead. And we have projects up and down the country. We work in health and wellbeing with um, organisations like the Health Foundation. We work in the police justice system, we work in a talent system, and all of that's linked. So as a researcher, I was invited to join their youth board. I joined their youth board. I was then invited to become one of their first cohort of funded internships, strategic development internships. And I thought, well, hey, um, Leaders only done one project in Scotland, let's get to. So I went and got funding and we did our North Ayrshire Mental Health Commission, which was the first of its kind here in Scotland. And from that, Leaders Scotland has developed. We have been funded for three years to do what we're calling Project Progress, which is an anti um, bigotry project. And I have to say, it's entirely linked to what we were talking about, about young people's future health, about them wanting to have that aspiration, that hope, that safety, to have that financial security, but also that, that feeling of community. And what we heard was that in every area of North Ayrshire and in Scotland, bigotry impacts that. And leaders led on that development. So we're now about to launch it. I'm meeting our young people for the first time tomorrow and I'm really excited. But I've taken on a different role. So from being that citizen researcher with the Young People's Future Health Inquiry in 2017, I'm now a project manager with leaders running this new three-year project. And I suppose that's exactly what we would love to see for every young person is that they can get an opportunity and that opportunity leads to more progress and leads to more substantive work and leads to a better future. Um, but what we know and in being involved in the advisory board and being able to, to dip in and out of all the post holders, to, to interview post holders, to help shortlist, to be able to pop in to Toby's and be involved in Toby's RSA work and hearing young people say exactly what we all know to be true, um, that they're struggling, that they're, the government wasn't listening, that the government wasn't going to help them at all was really, really impactful and to listen to them saying their solutions were to get more active and to be more civically engaged. I think that's something that really came out of the Young People's Future Health Inquiry. For me, was hearing young people, we often say that young people are disengaged or disenfranchised. I don't think they're disenfranchised. I think they're just fed up. They're fed up of nothing happening. They're fed up of governments making promises. And we're at a stage now where young people are starting to see it and they're starting to call it out. I've never seen so much youth engagement around, for example, the autumn statement that's coming on Wednesday, I think. 
I've seen screeds of stuff by young people saying, well, what's in it for us? Where's this for us? How does this impact us? That I've never seen that before, and I've been involved in youth politics and politics, I think, now for about 12 or 13 years. Um, so I'll stop there. I think Leaders has a role with loads of organisations that are on this call as well, um, and you'll all know of Rose, um, but it's great to be here as well. I look forward to the discussion. Great. Thank you for that, Nan. So um, we're going to hear from our final panellist now, Emma, and Emma, I think, has got a couple of slides we're going to share. So while that transition is happening, just to um, remind people, if you put questions in the chat, there's some nice discussion already starting there. You may find you can answer each other's questions yourself, but also if you can upvote any of the ones you'd like me to be putting to panellists later. So over to you now, Emma. Thanks, Joe, and thanks, everybody. It's been really great to hear from all the panellists for me, too. And I think there's definitely some commonality in the work that we do and, and the work I've heard from um, the other panellists, particularly that importance of involving young people before projects, during projects, and then having opportunities after projects for young people to continue to have um, participatory opportunities. But also that thing that um, uh, Rusha, Rusha said about the, um, uh, the, the opportunities to give young people power and the importance of giving young people power and when we do that that young people um always um step up and and also transform uh, the conversation so i think that's really we're really passionate about that so i'm from the association for young people's health uh, we are a organization that works across the uh, uk focusing on um better understanding and meeting the particular health and well-being needs of young people aged 10 to 25 and the reason i wanted to share a slide is so you can have some pictures to look at um, but also to to, um, um, just to, to highlight the different ways that we work. So um, young people's voices and young people's experiences are at the heart of everything that we do. Um, and we uh, work on th th that experience. We work with young people uh, around that alongside understanding what the data and the evidence is telling us, um, as well as then advocating with young people um, for change um, to their health and well-being. Um, and in terms of the work with the Health Foundation, which hopefully this will now move on to the second slide, um, we um, were delighted to have a um, three-year policy fellow post um, but embedded at um, AYPH. Um, they were called our Health, in Health Inequalities Policy Fellow, and the post was held for most of those three years by Rachel McEwen, who um, has since moved on to a new and exciting role um, in health. Um, and um, we were particularly looking at the, the ways in which health inequalities played out for particular groups and subgroups of young people. Um, and I guess I just wanted to reflect on how we engage young people throughout um, that process. Um, so from very, so from kind of the planning stages through to the early stages of the, the work, young people were absolutely at the heart of what we were doing. And one of the early ways that we did that was through our youth advisory panel, which was already established. And we particularly focused in the early um, parts of the project at things like looking at the language that we use when we talk about health inequalities um, and young people and the kind of words that we uh, use around health inequalities um, so you know vulnerable marginalized those kinds of words um, which we really wanted to understand how that made young people feel and the kinds of things um, that they would that, that they would like um, to be used when we're talking about these kinds of issues um, and then um, the kind of substantive engagement that we did through, through the project was via two um, uh, youth youth panels uh, focusing on particular groups of young people. So the first one was on ethnicity and health, um, and the second one was on care leavers or care experienced young people. Um, and in, for both of those, we worked in partnership with expert organisations and um, with the Race, Race Equality Foundation for the ethnicity and health panel, and with um, Quorum Voice for the care leavers and care experienced young people panel. And that's really important for us because we know that it's really important that we have those people working working alongside us and um, who bring particular expertise of working with those um, communities of young people and um, were able to recruit those young people um, in a meaningful way to those panels. Um, the other thing that was really important about that was that those panels had a kind of open agenda. We didn't say this was what was going to happen at every meeting. We allowed for young people to shape those events and to co-produce those panel meetings. And then we also allowed for young people to decide how they wanted to share the findings from that, what creative ways that they wanted to do that, and how they themselves wanted to be involved in that process. So some of them may not wanted, didn't want to be hugely involved, but some of them wanted to uh, present the findings in a webinar with us. Some of them wanted to create a podcast, some of them wanted to do art and 
other creative ways and indeed some of that has led to um, follow on policy and meetings with policy leads in the part for education, particularly around the care experienced um, young people. Um, so um, that that kind of process which really allows for um, the opportunity for co-development throughout. And then the final thing I wanted to say is one of the really important things for us is what happens next. And during the during the three year pro a project we developed um, a training course um, on health inequalities in young people and the young people who were involved as well as additional young people were able then to train as to be young trainers with us and are continuing to work with us to um, share um, that training course um, with um, the health system um, you know far and wide in the UK so that that kind of loop is really really important um, to the work we do and I think that's probably it for now Joe and we can go on to the other stuff in the questions. Great, thank you, um, Emma. And um, so hopefully people had a chance to get onto the Mentimeter. And first question really was trying to gauge the sort of level of confidence people who are joining the call um, have. And we've got, um, you know, a spread there, but I think um, clearly some people who have experienced in the space, um, but others who I guess are here because they are wanting to learn a bit more and hear what's working. In terms of the tips um, that we sort of were wanting to tap into from um, people who are here, um, I think, you know, several things looking at this came out to me. Um, one was um, about the need to build the relationships, the good planning, you know, the sort of this something about this that where structure is quite important, the dedicated youth participation that we need, the recognition of rewarding, compensating for people's time. So there's a kind of there's a very sort of hard side to this in terms of getting it right. But also I'm kind of seeing there some of the more um, I suppose, you know, slightly more philosophical things about, you know, the the spirit in which you enter that space and the sort of nature of the, you know, the quality of the relationship that you want to um, build, that you're recognising the expertise that those individuals are bringing to you and, you know, the importance of going to them in their spaces um, and sort of listening from them. So um, quite interesting there, I think it's touching on the fact that there is both the need for that sort of more hard structured sort of approach that has to be sort of very well organized in the engagement um, and also that sort of philosophy and ethos that you bring to it for it to be um, effective and great to see um, more things um, coming up uh, as we're speaking. So I'm going to turn now to um, sort of engage the panel on some questions that we've kind of thought about beforehand. Um, and one of the ones, um, the first question that we want to talk about is how we, um, or how people who are wanting to engage in people in policy development can make sure that um, they get the sort of right breadth and diversity of young people involved and how they sustain that relationship. So I think, um, you know, one of the things that's come up, people say, make sure this isn't tokenistic and clearly one, illustration of that is that these relationships um you know kind of are sustained and go through to impact so um i'm going to start uh russia if it's okay with you on that um, um could you tell us a little bit then just about that specific thing of how you make sure you're engaging the right mix of young people and making sure um that it's a sustained relationship uh yes um so i think Toynbee Hall we're in a quite a unique position in that we we have we have a large network of people already that are very involved in these types of projects we've been doing this approach for about six years um so when it came to recruiting it we already have a lot of community networks places that we could reach out and bring people in um and within this project we really were looking for people that had a wide range of experiences such as being young carers um being disabled um, being from ethnic minority backgrounds under the umbrella of, of as many people as possible being from low income backgrounds. Um, so for us, there was like a mixture of reaching out to local communities, snowballing sample, and also some people that we already knew who had participated in other projects. 
Um, in terms of making sure that people stay engaged, uh, there are a couple of things. Um, I wanted to touch on something that's already been discussed in the chat. One of the things that we do at Toynbee Hall that I think is very important is that we pay people for their time. I know that some places feel like that would taint the research or that um, people would get involved for quote, quote, the wrong reasons. Um, what we found is that it actually enables a wider mix of people to take part because if you are if you're not paying people for their time you're only going to get people that are financially able to give up their time um basically if we had taken the tactic of not paying people none of our peer researchers would have been able to participate um they're already under a lot of pressures at home uh to bring in money to help support their families um, and so being able to say, here's 15 pounds an hour to be part of our project, it's it's preferable to picking up shifts in a lot of places for young people. Um, and it enables them to do something that they're already very engaged with. Um, so we we find that generally people are not going to commit to something that's as intense as what we propose unless they're very invested in the project. <laughs> Um, we're talking about people learning a lot of new skills, designing research. Um, so that tends to happen. The So we don't tend to have people that get interested for the wrong reasons in the first place. Um, something to also, I guess, linked with that to flag for younger people is we've had experience working in the past where people will not necessarily want to reveal the very personal reasons why they might get involved with something. So on the surface level, it can seem like they're only getting involved um, for something else. So I'm always very hesitant to label people as getting involved for the wrong reason or be hesitant uh, to have somebody to exclude someone because of what I <laughs> what I am projecting my own experiences on. Um, and mm -hmm. what we tend to find is that as you get deeper into the project, people will start revealing, actually I got involved because I had this experience when I was younger and I'm very worried about my siblings. Um, mm -hmm. But because it's not very comfortable, they will start by saying, oh, I just got involved because I saw there's a bit of money for this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's something to also bear in mind that we shouldn't be looking yeah. at what people, yeah, what, what people are saying is, um, necessarily the full extent we're only hearing what people are willing to share and that's especially increased with younger people who have a lot of uh social worries and other things that might make it a little bit more difficult to share with their peers yeah um, I think that's um so, sorry Russia just to um come in there I mean I think that actually is a really interesting and valuable sort of insight there that how people might present initially when they're getting involved actually may be slightly superficial understandably and actually through those longer relationships you start to see kind of maybe um, some of the sort of deeper motivators but there's something you touched on there that I was going to actually put as a question to Emma in fact which was you, you know, you started alluding to sort of different ages of young people. And um, as Toby said, you know, I mean, 16 to 24 or sometimes 12, 20, you know, there's a bit of, you know, it kind of varies. Some people it goes up to 29 when they're doing work. And so, Emma, I'm kind of interested in your um, reflections on kind of it is quite an age range and it's an age range at an age where people are changing and developing a lot. And sort of what advice and sort of experience do you have about working with sort of different segments of the young people population and and how you kind of tailor things for those different stages, you know, whether it's between 12 to 24 or 16 to 29 and what, what people need to think about there? Very good question. Um, so I think, first of all, what I would say is it is in the planning stages. So it's thinking about um, a, a very, uh, we often get requests to do engagement. And so we just want to talk to young people. So so what we have to then think about in the early stages is which, which you know, what age gr group of young people, what particular group of, of young people, and that age range that you are focusing on in the early stages um, is really important. And then once you've got that, then that comes down to that kind of skill that you have from your participants 
participation workers or from um, you know the the partner organisations that you're working with to design um, a, an engagement that fits with that that bracket. That being said, um, we are I'm running engagement at the moment with young people um, who are affected by um, excess weight and obesity, um, and we have a huge range. I mean, you know, I've had um, seven year olds up to twenty year olds um, in a room, um, and that doesn't as it always comes with uh, some challenge to that. But I think for us, it is about then having it, it's, it's about the skill of the facilitators. It's about having a methodology which you can bring in different creative elements um, that can then speak to the different needs in the room um, and that they won't only be to do with age and age appropriateness. They will also be to do with developmentally appropriate um, approaches. Um, and so then always having a range of options in ways that you can work is really, really important. Um, and then being able to be very you know, in doing participation work, you need to be able to adapt and change it. You know, you need to be able to start 10 minutes late um, to allow for young people to arrive. You need to be able to, you know, maybe move things around a little bit if it's not working. You need to have be a very responsive to the way in which a group is working so that you can really um, enable everybody to be engaged. Um, the other thing that I would say um, is how you are, how young people are supported and the wraparound support that they have. So we're often working um, with young people that we might not know um, ourselves. Sometimes we, we have our own youth advisory panel, but sometimes we're delivering for other projects. And certainly in that work on excess weight that I'm doing at the moment, um, having other staff in the room who the young people know, who can then reflect with them, have time out if they need to, um, to talk about um, how things are going, whether that, you know, and have options, I guess, um, because it, it's not, it's important that, it, you know, if it's uncomfortable for any young person to be in a room, that they've got somebody that they can talk to about and an option not to be there. I hope that gives some reflection, Joe. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. And I think just on this um, question of sustaining the relationships, I think, Toby, I might just come to you on this question now, because obviously with the work you were doing um, at the RSA and you had um, young people you were working with who were keeping diaries and by, by necessity you wanted that over a sustained period. So interested in the kind of challenges um, and ways in which you might have overcome um, any of that in terms of sustaining that interest and contribution. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Joe. Um, and I think I'm probably going to repeat quite a lot of what Russia and Emma have both said. Um, I think we were very lucky at the RSA in that we were actually quite good at sustaining that interest from young people. Uh, we started uh, in 2020 with 14 young people on our advisory board. And by the end of the process, we still had 14 young people actively involved coming along to meetings. Um, I think pay was no small part of that. Uh, I think that was one of the significant differences between uh, how we run our advisory board and maybe how some of the other policy holders uh, had similar advisory boards. Um, and I think there is that sense of, uh, this isn't just a space where we value your opinion, but we're, we're showing you that we value your opinion uh, and we value kind of the, the work that you're doing for us. Um, and I think particularly with the diary research, uh, when you are asking young people to log in once a month and spend maybe an hour uh, of their of their day or of their yeah of their, of their time uh, responding to, to these questions uh, I think uh, obviously making sure that they see some financial compensation for that is important um, but we also made real efforts particularly with the diary research where I think it could have just been something where we were a commissioning organization we set this up through um, youth fight was the organization that we we worked with although they've now been uh, merged with Savanta, um, and they were brilliant. So if anyone does need a partner, I would really recommend them. Um, but rather than just being kind of a com commissioning organization and just getting all this data that then we would analyze, we made sure that we had three workshops throughout the process so that uh, the young people we were working with weren't just kind of getting this screen each month that they'd log into and respond to. Um, they knew the work that, that they were contributing to. We had explained kind of what the project was hoping to achieve. And I think particularly for those young people who maybe more often than not engage with market research uh, or those kind of less uh, aligned with, with potentially what their views are or their values are, um, if that's their main way of operating with research, I think we, we made a real difference. And at, at the end of that process, we had lots of young people or lots of young people who were involved in it tell us that actually it had been quite therapeutic for them to talk about their financial situation. Uh, that they really appreciated that they were spending their time doing something that hopefully would make a bit of a difference and they didn't have any uh, 
uh, misplaced kind of views on that. They they weren't like this is going to be this is going to be the thing that finally changes uh, all policies to be more friendly towards young people. But they they did appreciate feeling like someone was 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 listening to that. Um, and I had one final thing that was really interesting that has or I thought it was interesting well, that has yeah. slipped my mind. I'll come back in. Make a note because we're you know we're going to be going um, round again. So I'm going to bring Nairn in now and move the uh, discussion on a little bit more. Um, so um, obviously for this, for in, you know, involvement of young people in policy development, um, for it to be impactful, uh, with, there needs to be an appetite. Pa policymakers themselves um, want to hear the voices of young people. So I'm kind of interested in your reflection. You touched on this a little bit, but do you think policymakers are recognising the need to hear from young people? Has the case been made to them? You know, is there more that needs to be done so that um, there's a recognition of the importance of this voice? Yeah, so I think this work in particular has made it really clear to a number of influential policy makers and especially policy designers that involving young people from the very beginning is really important to get buy-in, not just from elected members and elected officials, but also from the general public. We can see trends within um, is civic engagement, that young people are becoming more and more civically engaged and the difference between getting 80% of the youth vote and 75% of the youth vote can mean the difference between having a massive majority in the House of Commons to hung parliament and the parties are starting to recognise that and there's a lot less of the sort of pandering attitude that we saw back in the 2005, 2010 election, 2015 and those more serious sort of policy announcements aimed towards young people and I think this is you can this you can see this through all the kind of major parties. There's something there that they're trying to attract young people to their support with. But for policy designers, I mean, having organisations like the RSA involved, and you know, AYPH is in their name, but having organisations like that involved, and the Mental Health Foundation and the Health Foundation, that gives credence to the idea that you can engage with young people, you can take their views, and you can make really influential policy that will change people's lives. It's not just about ticking a box. It's not just about pandering. It's about making real change. And if you want to do that, you need young people to buy in right from the beginning and to follow through right from the start. That's um, that, that, that's really interesting. I'm going to come back to that uh, a little bit later. But I'll turn to Emma now, perhaps, because I guess, Emma, in your role, you know, you're probably, you know, one day you're, you know, sat in a room, as you say, with a whole mix of people, 11 to 20 year olds, you know, the next day you're perhaps sat somewhere with people in NHS England or some other government department and so on. And so what's your, you know, and maybe having worked in this space for quite a while now, what's your reflections on the interest and appetite that policymakers have to hear from young people? Um, thanks, yeah, no, I think, I guess, first of all, I think there is definitely, I would absolutely agree with them, there is a definitely in principle, yes, uh, um, a, a real case. Uh, the case has been made in many ways around the importance of hearing young people's voices, which is fantastic. But I think on the flip side, there is something which in practice needs a kind of continual reminding to those people in policy and in the various decision making places of the, how to do that and to do that in, in the best way. And certainly I think there remains that that issue around power and um, where the power is for decision making to take place and um, kind of worry about what happens if you allow young people to have power power within um, decisions is still at the heart, I think, of, of concern often. So still, you know, when we are doing work with policy leads and when I say, well, I've got a group of young people and they want to come and meet you. Well, on one hand, they're really excited about that because they really want to talk to young people about things. But on the other side, they do get nervous about it because they're thinking, well, am I going to be able to respond? What are these young people going to ask me? Are they going to ask me something that I can't do? So I think um, we've got to recognise that. Um, and that is something that we often play as a kind of broker organization to enable policy um, leads to meet with young people in a way which is meaningful which I think is really important so I think um, the, the, a couple of reflections I think would be for me in terms of policymakers is is really being clear about um, 
how they want to involve young people on the kind of when we don't use a kind of hierarchical look at how what kind of engagement you're doing we use a more kind of um linear thing but are they you know are they informing are they consulting are they trying to collaborate are they involving are they trying to empower young people to being really honest and open at a policy level about how the way in which you're trying to involve young people um but secondly also really thinking about the policy cycle so the policy decision making cycle so we have done some work on um ethical engagement in research and we've looked with research health policy researchers about the, the research cycle and the, all of the opportunities in that research cycle for involving young people and I think the same can be said for policy so if we're looking at the policy um, process and I'm not a policymaker so I don't know it in detail but if we if working with policymakers how within that policy cycle are they involving young people so that we can make sure that it, all of the opportunities are considered the, uh, that we take those up which are really possible and, and we make sure that that is a really meaningful process um, for, for the young people um, that we're working with. Great, thank you. And I think one of the um, sort of reflections that was made by a number of you in your introductions was kind of being able to show the impact of the participation, you know, sh show back to young people that by them giving up their time, it is... Um, it is making a difference and so I think maybe just very quickly it'd be interesting to hear from each of you an example of where you kind of have had that satisfaction of involving young people in some of your work and then being able to kind of show back to them the impact it's had so just very quickly it would be interesting to hear some of those concrete um, examples and I think maybe if I start uh, Russia with you would that be okay for you to go uh, first on that? Um, yes, I, I think one that comes to mind as a, as a good example for something that's a, a bit more of an immediate insight um, is we did, a, we did a community safety project and one of the initial findings from the first phase was that basically older people were, were terrified of younger people on the estates and there was this, an assumption that they were always, always up to no good um, and anything like that and what we decided to do was, was bring uh, a lot of younger people in and start to have them co-design something to mend those relationships um, and dispel a lot of the the stigma. And so we had we had a group of lots of very young people that had never been really asked to participate in everything in anything before. Um, they were very much viewed with suspicion, um, and they were very skeptical I should say at the beginning and uh very on edge um and through participating they uh not able were able to collaborate they ended up helping to design um an IT training scheme that they ran uh with older people to try and reshape how they did it um and that ended up being really successful and it's something that they ended up they kept on doing after we had like finished the project um, and it sort of rolled over and has now become part of the SAT community events as well. Um, and I, I think it went from them feeling very, very suspicious. What are these people going to be doing? We're just going to be brought in to be yelled at by older people into something that they really found engaging and entertaining. And uh, quite a lot of them are still involved with us in a number of different capacities and wanting to <laughs> collaborate in other ways because they they saw the immediate impact um and it, it can sometimes be a bit difficult with other policy ones where the policy is like very long and like a victory is like changing one single line in a document somewhere um but what we always try and do is is bring young people into those meetings whether it's meeting with uh decision makers whether it's going to share the results um, and try and get them to learn more about the process as well. So when the process is slow, they understand why it's slow, um, but also to try and find ways of giving them those easy wins so they can see the immediate impact that their work can have, at least in the local area. Yeah, no, that's a great story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, Toby, is uh, a moment from the work you did where you kind of felt you were able to play back the impact um that the participants yeah. had had absolutely um i think mine is going to be similar to russia's uh and i might give two very quickly if that's not too cheeky joe 
Um, but one, I think when we launched our first report, um, cost of independence, uh, we were fortunate that that had real policymaker and press pickup. Um, and I think that that was great immediately to kind of demonstrate the the um, the interest in young people's stories uh, that, that there was in the wider world. Um, but I think what my predecessor, Fran, did brilliantly with that was open up the opportunities to talk to politicians and to talk to um, journalists and to talk on stages at events uh, further than just her to the young people who were advisors on that project. Um, so Nan, I think you came along to an APPG and presented, uh, and Owen, uh, who was one of our young advisors, I think actually might have been the one that did that. And Nan, I think you were at an event um, and other young people spoke to journalists. And I think that, as Russia kind of said, one of the best ways to show young people the impact they're having is to let them be the ones to have that impact. Um, so I do think it takes quite a, an egoless approach to be able to do that, to step aside uh, as a researcher and to say, not my voice that needs to be heard. But I think that's that's a great way of reporting that back. And similarly, from our policy workshops um, that we did across the UK, I think a great way to, 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 to build on what Russia was saying about not, uh, about subverting the very long process that policy change is, and the often quite like difficult to grasp uh, process is to make sure that young people again are those people having the conversations so that they can see how difficult it is to navigate policy policy world uh, so I think unfortunately uh, I never got to, to properly analyze these results but most young people came out of our workshops saying they didn't necessarily feel more hopeful about policy change because they had come up against the world uh, and and seen how like difficult it was to make progress but I think that they gained an understanding through that that was really important that they didn't just think uh, that people weren't listening and people didn't care. Actually, like this stuff is tricky and it's more than just kind of like you you say some words in a, in a workshop and then that's going to change the whole world. And I think that that, that was really great to kind of see, see uh, their response to that and, and their development through that as well. Right. Okay. And yeah, Emma, I'll come to you and then Nan. Um, so a moment that's had yeah. that kind of impact. Absolutely. Well, I can think of lots. Um, but I think I, I suppose a couple of principles, first of all, I think what it is really important that we have the results of what has happened as a result of engagement. And sometimes as advocates, we have to challenge um, the organisations we work with to understand what those results are. And we're often doing that um, because that's really important. The other thing that's really in, is that we some have some kind of public facing um, documents that often policy making processes go on behind closed doors. But we are really principled, you know, in principle, we will make sure that we always publish something on work that we're doing um, for young people to see the kinds of things that they've been seeing being recognised, which is really important. I think that direct opportunity to have to hear how people are impacted by work. So involvement of young people at webinars and things like that is great. But one of the things I wanted to highlight, I guess, was our um, the extension opportunity that we've been in, that young people now who've been involved in um, as, as uh, in the um, with the policy fellows work as young now working with as young trainers have to not only um kind of um be there as as a young person expressing their lived experience or view but actually to be there as a young trainer to um be influencing um you know other professionals um and policy makers views around health inequalities um and then have both the kind of formal delivery of that training but also um the kind of ad hoc conversations that you have with people um in in face-to-face -face training events to that, that that can be really really powerful so i think that has been incredibly um, uh, but both valuable for those attending the training, but also incredibly valuable for the young people to see the kind of difference that their um, involvement in that kind of course um, can have. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to Nern in a moment, but just to say we're then going to move on to um, getting into a few more practical tips and suggestions, and we'd be um, really keen to see people in the audience sharing some of their tips as well, um, as well as the panel. But Nern, so I mean, is there a moment you would point to where, as somebody who's been a participant, um, you felt, um, you know, your voice had some impact? I mean, if I can think back, I think it was one of the first major events I attended as a, as, as a young person as part of it. And it was Christmas time and I was, the Health Foundation brought some of his, um, from the Mental Health Future, Future Health Party to the, I think it was your annual showcase, Joe. And we were mm. standing in Somerset House. Um, and I was standing there thinking, I'm a 
working class kid for the top end of Steve, the top end of Stevenson. Um, what am I? What am I doing here? I, I'm never. I would never have expected to be in such a, an amazing building and to to be there and be speaking to people who were, you know, the leaders in the profession. There was politicians. There was academics, and they were asking my opinion and they were listening and they were taking it on board. And that's when I think I realised that this, the Young People's Future Health Inquiry, was something really, really special. Um, and was something that people were taking seriously and were taking us as participants seriously. Um, it was an amazing opportunity. And I think that was back in, I think, 2017. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I mean, that's when, that's when I realised that, that people were, like this was an organisation that people listened mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, um, you know, listening to some of these examples, it just kind of shows, like, I think there is the appetite to listen and hear these voices. It's kind of almost there aren't enough opportunities for people so the more um the work that your organization's doing the work that people in the audience are doing to facilitate this um i think um can really help so we're going to move on now yeah just kind of to get into a few more really practical things i mean there's been some great suggestions as we've been talking but you know for organizations that are maybe you know, wanting to put their toe in the water, you know, they haven't done this before, where do I start? Um, it'd be good to get some really crunchy um, sort of tips on that. So, um, yeah, where should I start? Emma, you're smiling. I'm going to start with you. Uh, it's always tips. dangerous to, yeah. to, to smile. smile. Um, so I think that well, there are lots of people out there who are doing really good work. Um, already and who have, there's lots of structures that are out there to support you you know there's lots of stuff on our website but also I'm sure all the other organizations that are here and more um, so I would um, I would be first of all thinking about you know what what is it that you want young people to be involved in um, and then be really um, honest and open about how what part of that kind of engagement um, uh, continuum you want to it might just be that you're informing young people at the early stages it might be then that you want to kind of move on to some kind of um consultation um it doesn't have to be i think what often happens when people are starting is they think right what we've got to do is set up a youth panel and that's the first thing because everybody's setting up a youth panel and that's what we need to do and actually if you haven't done engagement um before that's not necessarily the right thing um if you're going to set up a youth panel then the, the purpose of that panel needs to be really clear um, and you need to have um, the, the skilled staff to support that um, and you need to be thinking about the, the safeguarding and the other support that young people who are involved on that have. So I would be open and honest about that. I think about partners. Who are the partner organisations that can support you? Um, and I think there was another kind of um, question that was coming up around demographics and I think that's also the, the, the similar point that I would make there is that who are the, who are the partner organisations who are the specialists who can help you and then the final thing I would say that we always say in all engagement is is what have young people already said about this topic we might all be amazing organizations with our own purposes but the young people have already told us a lot of things and we need to be really careful about asking young people to tell us the same things that we've already been told um, and so that is something that I think is a really good practice so we do a lot of scoping reviews on you know, we've just done some work on epilepsy and diabetes and as well as doing engagement with you know trying to extend engagement with the groups of young people um from groups more likely to be affected by inequalities we did a whole piece of scoping to understand what young people had already told us so there is an there's an important bit about understanding that as well as um then starting out on a new um participation journey thank you for that um toby i'll turn to you now um just a few of your top tips to build on that Great. Um, and that was that was brill, Emma. Um, I think building on that, uh, one of the big mistakes we made at the RSA, and it wasn't the whole way through, but but it really sticks out in my memory, is where we didn't do uh the work that needed to be done before we involved young people. Um, so we had our advisory board, um, and we really wanted to get their voices like on our website and get them telling their own stories and do a series of blogs where it was young people talking about young people's policy. We had these brilliant, interesting thinkers um, who had really interesting takes on like some of the big topics of uh, economic insecurity. Um, and we did loads of work to make sure that they were supported in doing that, but we didn't necessarily tick across all the T's uh, on the organizational side to get those out in the public. And then we had all this problem, all these problems further down the line 
where we hadn't necessarily got that sorted. And, and that was, I think, a big blow to our relationship with those young people uh, where they had been asked to do one thing and then the, it, it hadn't played out in the way that they were expecting. Um, so I think my biggest tip is always like, make sure you are doing the work before you involve young people. Like don't, don't expect them to kind of stick with you on the journey while you figure it out. Uh, but having said that, I think don't be afraid to let them lead you as well. So don't think you have to have everything perfectly figured out before you involve young people. I think it is just, uh, I think what everyone has said lots is making sure that you devolve power to, to, to young people if, if you, that's what you want from them, if that's the involvement you want from them. Make sure that they can lead you where where they think your work should go, uh, where they think your policies should go, um, and and that's I guess like part of part of the deal. Um, and then finally, I just say don't overclaim on it. Like as Emma has said, it's it feels like a really hot topic to be like, how are we involving young people at the moment? Um, and it doesn't need to happen in every situation, and it shouldn't be the kind of tick box exercise that you're doing to be like, and we've involved young people. Uh, particularly if you're saying uh, we're led by young people's voices, but actually all you're doing is consulting, that will really undermine that sustaining effort that I think we're all trying to do in engaging young people. Um, I think you need to make sure that that what what you're speaking about externally and talking about publicly is what matches the young people's experiences who are involved in your project. And then also, sorry, so importantly, as Emma said, there's so much expertise. We couldn't have done this without loads of the brilliant organisations who helped us. So Gizda in Gwyneth, uh, Action Now in Northern Ireland, uh, Bradford Young Citizens in Bradford, Leaders Unlocked, Youth Site. Uh, there's so much expertise and people are so generous with it. So uh, just rely on, on the expertise that is already out there. Yeah, that's a nice thought. Um, Russia, um... There were a couple of things that came up in the chat that I think sort of speak to this more practical side, and you have answered some of them, but just I think it'd be good to um, air. I think people are interested in hearing a little bit more about creative techniques. Um, and then the second um, thing was around primary age children. There's been some questions around, and I, if you may not have experience, I think you may have answered that question. But anyway, um, any things you would like to share, but if you can speak to those two points of creative techniques and younger age groups, that would be valuable. Um, yes, I can do it. I, I think echoing a lot of what Emma and Toby said, um, in terms of we always try and do uh, literature reviews at the beginning um, and really share that expertise at, at the start um, with our young people. We have, uh, as I mentioned, we do a participatory action research approach, so we don't necessarily have our focus at the beginning. Um, but what we will do is we'll go through the literature. We will say, here's where stuff is missing. Here's where, uh, here's what people say they are. Um, what are your reflections on this and, and collaborate together? Um, and I'll say that if, if you're going to do that approach or co-production approaches more generally, um, the biggest recommendation I have, aside from being very willing to cede power, <laughs> um, is to trust the process. I've worked with a lot of organizations, I've worked with Ofgem, I've worked with DWP, um, that are very skeptical at the beginning. And I, I repeatedly say it at the start of any her project at the start of any co-production approach it will look like a mess and it will look like you're never going to get anything done and you will want to jump in and try and take control and you just have to let the start of the project breathe and it will it will start all clicking into place as it goes along um when you're working with people that aren't professional researchers aren't professional policy people they're going to have different approaches to things and that's what makes the work so valuable um and I think that's a good lead into creative approaches. So what we always try and do is budget more time at the beginning. And I'm a very big fan of um, delaying starting research stages of the pro project until we're very, very sure that we've really explored what we want to at the very beginning when we're designing the project. Um, and so with this project, the original plan, the ESYP project, the original plan was to do focus groups um, we started talking with the young people. They were like, we want to do something creative. And so we had a lot of discussions with them. Would it be poetry? Would it be photography? Um, would it be this thing called photo voice? <laughs> that, and we, we did presentations on different examples. And um, the first thing that they they actually wanted to do was gardening. And so 
we created a whole set of workshop. Uh, we created a workshop plan around gardening and we tried it out and it was a disaster and it didn't work at all. <laughs> and I think in, in other organizations, people might get frustrated. We tried this, it didn't work. Um, and what we did is we were like, okay, we have the learning from this. We can write up, we'll never do good thing again and we can explain why. Um, but I think the young people really appreciated that even though we were skeptical that it would work, we let them try it um, and that we gave them the trust to do something, fail and then try something different. Um, and I, I think one that helps with project engagement, but two, I think failures are, are just as valuable as successes in, in helping all of us move forward with research. Um, I think the final thing about working with younger people, so um, I've done it a bit here, I've done it also in my previous work as well, we work with young people. Um, you can do it and you often have to do a much more creative approach. Um, I think one of the things, especially if you're talking about difficult subjects, learning from approaches like um, there's an approach called drawing and talking, which is used in a therapeutic sense, which is a way of uh, talking about difficult things with children and young people without it being overwhelming. So you're keeping everything on the page. Um, you could do something that's much more uh, hope focused. So like creating things that are about hopes for the future. Um, but I will throw out there that it, it is often difficult. The, the specific reason why we decided to do this project with 16 year olds and over is because once you get under that age, there's a lot more safeguarding risks. So you start having to have a lot more staff capacity um, on hand in case things go wrong. Um, but also you have to make sure that you set up an environment um, over time where a child can feel comfortable sharing their views and opinions that might differ from their parents. Um, and that does not say that parents are like, scary or anything like that but I think often when you're a young person you sometimes don't necessarily know what you feel you're you're taking things from your friends you're taking things from people around you so you need to invest a bit more time in that process the younger somebody is to give them time to figure out actually what they want to say um and that can be from anything like we've done ones with about healthy food um, and you can tell initially at the beginning, all of the young people were saying that they really liked the healthy snacks that their parents liked. Um, and then after a while, you, they started getting more comfortable disagreeing. I, I actually don't like this thing that my parent really wants me to have. Um, uh, so it might it might not be something that is uh, a danger, but in terms of research, you it, it is it is more intensive. Uh, so that's something yeah. to bear in mind. Great, thank you for that, some really practical advice there. So there was a question um, in the chat, which was about asking, you know, kind of almost, you know, given that, as we've been saying, there's quite an extended sort of timeline of activities during the policy development process. There was a question about where in the policy cycle um, is it most valuable? You know, would you, you know, if you had to prioritise, where would you prioritise bringing in young people's voices? So, Nen, I was going to turn to you on that question. Yeah, and I think it would be really easy for me to say that it's important to have young people's voices involved at all stages, and it is. But actually, the most important stages, I think, are right at the beginning when you're trying to decide what approach to take, where to focus your time and energy, and right just before that end bit. When you're, when you're looking at the data, you're looking at the research, and you're trying to decide what's the most important things to take out of this. One of the things that we did in Leaders in our um, the North Asian Mental Health Commission, for example, that I ran was our young people wrote the report. So we got all the data together. There was lovely infographics. You can see it on our website, gorgeous infographics. But beside every infographic was a young person saying, you know, here's what I got out of this. Here's what I think. I don't agree with this. I don't agree with that. But here's what I would do. Here's my solutions. And I think if you've got a, a, a research project or you've got a policy development that's going to take a long period of time, instead of saying to young people, I want you to commit for three years, I want you to commit for 18 months, say to them, right, we're going to come to you the now and we're going to ask you, where should we focus? How should we do it? Who should we target? And we're going to come back to you when we've done all that work and say, are we missing anything? What should we? What should the outcomes be for this? And so I think bookending with young people is super important. If you can afford to have them involved throughout the whole period and you can get them to commit to that period of time, great. But if not, bookend them and make sure that you get them to have a real say on what the final outcome is and a real say on how you get there in the first instance. 
That's great. That's so helpful. Thank you for that. Okay, so we're um, kind of coming to the final stretch. I've got, there's another question in the chat that um, I'm going to put the panelists, but um, which was the question around um, the values and structures to emphasize um, to ensure co-design and co-production um, with young people. But I think just before, so heads up to the panel, I'm going to come and ask you all to share some thoughts on that. But before I do, um, I'm just conscious I may have missed some questions. So if anyone from MPC wants to flag anything that they think we haven't covered that needs to be covered, um, just give me a shout out. But um, I think otherwise, um, let's take that, um, I think, really practical, but actually quite challenging question of, yeah, what are the values and structures you really need to embed and emphasize in your work if you're going to have um, a uh, good co-production, co-design process? OK, I'm going to start with um, uh, Russia. I'll start with you this time. Uh, yes, so I think like I agree with with a lot of what's been put in the chat. Um, I, I think one of the main things, if you want to make sure it's really embedded in an organization's culture, that people are the experts of their own experience. Um, what can sometimes happen is people can feel like um, their views are only consulted in a tokenistic way, or alternatively that uh, they're judged for having wrong views or they're seen as having some sort of false consciousness like that oh but you don't really think that um, you've been made to think that and and so just really trusting people uh, where they're at um, I would say you if you want to get involved in co-production and these co-design approaches you really have to invest and understand that a lot of groups are going to be very suspicious of you at the beginning. It, it takes time to build up that trust and it will take a number of cycles of working with people before they, they fully engage with the process. And that's OK. Um, and you need to really acknowledge in those groups where you're coming from. Um, something that I like to do with my projects is, is share how I'm connected with things. So if, if I talk about emotional support for young people, I talk about, uh, for example, my experience that I had when I was younger as a young carer. I talk about um, different places that I might be from, like I talk about my family's history, migrating, um, things that help build those connections as well to get people to understand that they're not going to be judged for what they share. Um, to really like develop a space where people feel comfortable. Um, the other thing that we've done when we when we we did lots of consultation with our, our peer researchers um, about a year ago, asking what makes what can we do better, and one of the big things that came out, which was quite surprising to us but makes sense in retrospect, was they really wanted to know and follow along with other projects that were going on, even if they were not involved in any way. Um, and they didn't want to know about it at the end, but they wanted to really feel like they were they were almost part of an organization. So just like somebody within the staff team would know, oh, we're doing this project and that project and that project's doing workshops at the moment. Um, they also wanted to come along that journey with us um, and see how we're working with other groups as well so that it felt more like a community. Um, and so that's something that we're working on to try and really make uh it very clear that at all stages of the organization and all parts we're really trying to bring people in um as well um right. so I think, yeah i think that would be a starting point thank you yeah and so toby actually i can see you've um chipped into the chat but you know it'd be good to hear those i think in the recording for people who listen, listen afterwards so do you want to just uh share your reflections on that question yeah, sorry, I've been having such a fun time typing uh, lots of answers, so uh, <laughs> I forgot that the Q&A section was coming up. Um, I think uh, I've put a few things in there. Um, the one that I do think is really important is consistency. Um, I think that is essential for building trust with young people. Uh, we made sure that we were having quarterly meetings with young with, with our young advisors, we made sure that as much as possible we stuck to those quarterly meetings, and, and some of that is... Um, about maybe not having like a perfect thing that you can share at each meeting, like not being in necessarily like the right place. Uh, but that is like quite a nice way to build a relationship with uh, young people is to, is to show them that like they don't just always see the perfect product at the end of, of um, at the end of the project. 
uh, they, they get to get say in like a, an earlier draft uh, of a report or they get to shape a policy recommendation um, and uh, understand kind of like all the work that goes into into those things. So I think uh, consistency is good for making sure that you know, people know that that is going to be there um, and also for, for, for building like a, that trusting relationship, as I said. Uh, I think lots of opportunities to feed in um, is really key. We've spoken a lot about creative approaches and, and I know I've said this point lots in the chat, but I do just really want to make it again. Uh, creative approaches are great, but they are not appropriate for everyone. They're not a panacea for engaging young people, particularly uh, this work in Northern Ireland, working with young men and the creative part of the workshop was the bit that they struggled with the most. Um, and as anyone working with young people will know, engaging with young people, with young men is particularly tricky. Um, so, uh, or, or we, we're not very good at engaging them, I guess. Um, so I think like creative approaches are great and a really different way of engaging young people, but it's not, not necessarily uh, right for every situation. Sometimes people just want to sit and talk and be heard on, on the opinions that they have on things. So I think, uh, yeah, making sure that there are lots of different opportunities to feed in and to do it in a way that meets like your needs. Uh, and then we've all said it, uh, making sure that you've got an appropriate rewarding structure in place. Um, and then I've written down a couple of values, but I think the one that I haven't mentioned is uh, honesty. And I think just being open and honest with young people as much as possible. Um, we've mentioned it a bit, but uh, making sure that, that the understanding is there in your relationship as to what their expected uh, relationship is, is with you and what your respective relationship is with them. Uh, I think it's great where we can devolve as much power to young people as possible, but that doesn't have to be uh, how you involve young people. Like there is a spectrum of participation for a reason. Um, and I think just making sure that you are uh, open about why you have that level of involvement that you do, whether that's resources, whether that's just it doesn't work for your organization to suddenly become uh, completely open and, and led by a young youth advisory board. Um, I think just making sure that that everyone is aware of the reasons you're doing that is, is important. Great, thank you. Okay, so I think I'll now maybe just in the final few minutes and with Emma and then just pivot to a sort of set, another question that came in that talked a little bit about the barriers. So by all means, if you want to add anything to what you've heard, but um, Emma, um, you know, as I say, anything you want to add, but also where do you think the biggest barriers are to more youth uh, participation in policy work. Um, I was already to ask the other answer the other oh, question, Jane. That's fine. Yeah. Um, so um, I think Nan has already said this, but I do think it links into what I was going to say about co-design and co-production, um, which is I think one of the barriers is a concern about sharing power or a lack of honesty about sharing power with young people. Um, and one of the things I think it about co-design and co-production is they are terms that are bandied about and often used, but without really understanding what co-production and co-design mean. And co-production and co design mean that you are sharing power with the people you are co-designing and co-producing something with and if you're going to do that you have to follow a process and um, there are many different processes that you can follow and adapt um, but you, if you are saying that you're going to co-produce something you really need to be co-producing something so I think that um, uh, that is something that is is also a barrier is that sometimes when we use these terms we're not really clear or organizations aren't always clear about what they actually mean um, and that can lead to then a lack of clarity um, for young people um, about um, what, what they're actually doing. One of the other barriers I think is in the very early stages, and I think it comes back to something that Toby was saying about being absolutely making sure that what you're asking young people makes sense. So a lot of the work that we do is just to take a question that we've been asked and go, this doesn't make any sense. I do not know, as a young person, this would not make any young sense to them. So you really making sure that in the early stages, we're unpacking those complicated questions that we have to ask in our sectors and thinking what bit of this question is actually going to mean, be meaningful to a 12 year old and a 16 year old and a 20 year old and how are we going to design it in a way that that is going to be um, really clear so making sure that we, the complexity of sometimes things we're asking that simplification and making sure that that really makes sense at the, at the very beginning um, and and sharing power um, I think that some of the other barriers you know are sometimes um, safeguarding and some of the structures that we have to have around safeguarding do become uh, rightly so concerns for organizations 
Um, and so I think that is about having the um, the commitment to um, safeguarding structures for your participation work that are distinct to if you're doing other work on, you know, certainly in our field and in clinical work, um, uh, distinct safeguarding approaches for working um, with young people. That being said, I would say that we have in hugely inspiring work with young people from some of, affected by some of the most significant harms including sexual violence and trauma of, of the real um uh, kind of supportive um benefits of group participation work for those young people and so i think it, that then it's about just finding those expert organizations that can help you um to um to design that in a way that is really safe um and um and meaningful Great, thank you. And then before I wrap up, Nan, um, final reflections from you? Yeah, I mean, and I've said in the chat, so I think one of the biggest barriers that people have is that young people are not filtered. You know, they've not been in all loads of meetings. They haven't been at, uh, many of them haven't been through the kind of the, the upper, further or higher education. So they have absolutely no filters. And when they are empowered and when you have supported them great and you've done that support and they feel safe, they will be if you have um, if I, you have the title counsellor in front of your name or your doctor or professor or CEO or whatever they do will not care. I think uh, quickly the best example I can think of this, we did a, a PB, we ran a participatory budgeting with the lottery. Our young people helped give out 80 grand to mental health charities and, and groups in North Ayrshire. And one came forward for a, through the council, it was actually a council group came forward and they wanted to do this project. I think they wanted to do like, positive affirmation murals and our young people could score out of 40 they gave it one like one one point out of there was 20 young people in that room all scoring and the score they got was one because they said it's tokenistic they haven't engaged young people who wants this nobody really likes it this is rubbish it's, it gives young people makes young people think that we're all that kind of naive that saying a really positive thing in a picture will make us feel better they gave it one out of 40 and i was sitting there going I'm going to have to go back and feed that back. And as somebody who, who like works with the council, I'm like, I don't, I don't want to feed that back. Maybe that's like the lottery's position because they were absolutely brutal. And that can scare organisations. Sometimes that light is really scary. But see, when you stand in it and young people can, it makes everything better. It makes your project better. It makes your work better. Um, so getting over that hurdle of that fear of the young people being brutally honest can be really difficult. But when you get over that, the results are fantastic. Yeah. Well, I think that is a fantastic point to conclude on. I mean, I think there's been so much rich insight. Thank you so much to our panellists and thanks particularly to people also for all the conversation in the chat. Um, I've learned a lot listening to this, but I think just a couple of things I'll take away really is something about how important we all are as organisations in involving young people and constantly constantly kind of promoting the importance of their voice and there's something we can do there um, the importance of transparency when we're working with young people what we're doing why we're doing it um, the need for an egoless approach and I think perhaps that final <laughs> example from Nan sort of summed it up you know also the willingness sort of to fail and learn um, so thank you very much everyone I hope it's been useful and have a good evening <laughs>